Hi there. We will start today off with Psalm chapter 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes and mortals in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. For your God, O Zion, for all generations, praise the Lord. Our next reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is here, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared ask him any question. And our final reading today comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 11 to 14. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that, he, that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with the hands that is not the, of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls, with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, sanctifies those who have been defiled, so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience? From dead works to worship the living God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So did you ever notice how men, we act tough, but we actually aren't? <laughs> uh, I remember I had this student teacher. Uh, I was in middle school, I think about 7th or 8th grade, I think 8th grade. And he was in the army as well. And part of his training was he had to walk through a gas chamber. So he actually brought in the video of his experience with that. And there were all these big, tough guys. They're walking into this gas chamber. And then they come out and they're crying and they're gagging. Ugh, ugh, ugh. <laughs> and then this woman, she walks out. And it's not like she's like a huge lady, like not big and tough. No, she's, she's actually kind of, if I recall, a tiny little thing. And... <laughs> She walks out of this gas chamber like she is walking out of the supermarket. <laughs> I mean, she just looks so indifferent. I mean, kind of bored, actually. <laughs> and dads, uh, I'm sure you'll remember, you change a diaper, and it's like you are you are going through chemical warfare yourself. <laughs> I mean, men, when they change a diaper, they're gagging, they're yelling for somebody to grab them a gas mask. It's like, oh no, we've got nuclear meltdown going on. This is not a drill. Every man for himself. But moms, you change a diaper like you're just washing the dishes or you're pulling weeds out of the garden. Uh, you wash your hands and you look at your husband and you say, all right, well, all right, let's go to the, for lunch. I'm starving. <laughs> 
And uh, I've worked some pretty tough jobs in my life. Uh, I've done construction. Uh, I would stack 80 to 100 pound boxes on the skids out of shipping containers. I've loaded Christmas trees on the flatbeds. But I tell you what, if I have the sniffles, I am down for the count. I'm on bed rest. I revert back to being a five-year-old when I have a cold. And the sad thing is, I would love to say that, you know what, I'm just a wimp. But I know actually that is the standard for the male gender. I've seen men continue to work with blood running down their arms, they're beaten, they're bruised. But I tell you what, they get a cold and they turn into Edgar Allan Poe. It's so all of a sudden they're like, oh, for what dreadful sin did I commit to deserve this wretched bleakness that has fallen upon me? For I feel the coldness envelop me. I hear the bells toll. That's every guy when we have a cold. <laughs> I think it's time to admit, guys, that we are not as tough as we think we are. I think of the worst pain that I have ever endured in my life. Um, it was either when I had a cyst lanced or when I scratched my eye. Uh, the eye thing just happened this year. But the cyst, I had that when I was in college. And I was driving into the doctors to get it looked at um, because it was like a pre-surgery appointment or something like that just to look it over. But I get there, the doctor, he's looking at it and he said, oh, you know, we, we need to do this now. Uh, we're going to lance this now and then remove the tracks that is allowing the infection into your skin. Uh, we'll remove them surgically later. And he said, but if we let this go, it, it's not going to be good. We, we need to do this now. So they lanced it. And if you don't know what lancing means, it means the doctor, he cut it and he allowed the infection from the cyst to drain out. So at the time, it's numb, you know, it's numb, it's fine, it's all good, no big deal. But he said, you're not going to want to go to college today. This is this is going to hurt a little later because, dumb me, I had not taken the painkillers they had given me. Because I planned on driving uh, the 45 minutes to an hour back to Messiah College. So he says, yeah, you're going to want to go home because you haven't taken your painkillers. So once that numbing agent that they had around the cyst faded, it was too late. I, I took a pain pill because I started to feel it hurt, but it was too late. The pain was too set in. And oh, that was miserable. I mean, it felt like my back where they had lanced this was on fire. Now the eye thing, it was even dumber because at least I had an excuse for the cyst. I, I was planning on going back to college and I didn't want to drive while uh, having painkillers in my system. But the eye, <laughs> uh, I get really bad allergies. So I was rubbing my eye just like this. And unfortunately, I didn't realize there was a hard pointy thing on the end of my finger where the cuticle is. It's like this hard pointy object, uh, part of my skin. And it worked its way under my eyelid. And so I cut my eye. And you want to talk about painful. I mean, at first I didn't, I was like, oh, oh, that, that probably wasn't good but it didn't really hurt that bad. But then pain started to set in later to the point where poor Liz, she had off the next day anyways. But on her day off, I have her at 3 a.m. driving me to the emergency room because it hurt so bad I couldn't even sleep it off. <laughs> but then I watched The Passion of the Christ and I realized that I don't know the amount of pain that Christ really went through. What I've gone through, it's nothing like what Christ went through on that cross. Because, you know, I had my, this uh, thing lanced on my back, but he had that all over his body. I scratched my eye, and it felt really painful on my eye, but he had that all over his body. I think of what St. Athanasius said on his uh, book, On the Incarnation. Uh, St. Athanasius I think I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> he uh, was a monk from the 4th century uh, who became then a bishop. But he wrote, For only upon the cross does one die with hands stretched out. Therefore it was fitting for the Lord to endure this and to stretch out his hands, that with the one he might draw the ancient people and with the other those from the Gentiles and join both together in himself. So on the cross... What St. Anasius was saying is Jesus had his hands stretched out. He was bridging the gap between the Jews and the Gentiles. So that then we, we all come together to greet our father's outstretched arms. 
just like the prodigal son going to his father who welcomed his son back with open arms. And that is why Psalms chapter 146 says, we are to praise God with all of our souls. We shouldn't trust any mortal, whether it be a celebrity or your average Joe, whether it be uh, your father or your mother, because every single human on this earth will die. Every single one of us will go back to the ground. But God is immortal. According to Psalm 146, this immortal God is who we should be giving all of our praise to. We're to trust our earthly mother and fathers to a point. But all, not all of our trust. All of our trust goes to the immortal God. The God who brings justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, according to Psalm 146, verse 7. Verse 8 says that God lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. But verse 9 says, the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. So we are to live in the ways of the Lord. We are to live for the Lord because the Lord loves the righteous. And the wicked, well, things don't end as well for them. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus was asked by a scribe, what is the greatest commandment? And what D Jesus did is he echoed the very sentiments of Psalm chapter 146. The first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. What Jesus did there in Mark chapter 12, verses 29 to 30, was actually paraphrase Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 5. That says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God and Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And then, as Psalm pointed out, God watches over and protects the oppressed. He feeds the hungry. He's with the prisoners. He's with the blind. He's with strangers. He's with widows. He's with orphans. So that is why Jesus said in verse 31 of Mark chapter 12, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, as the second greatest commandment. And what this is using is Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So what Jesus did was he was not rewriting anything. He was not making any new laws. He literally answered the question. He gave the two greatest Old Testament laws. Those were the two greatest commandments. So he did not introduce anything new. You know, this wasn't a moment where the angels came down out of heaven and the doves flew out in the air and uh, Jesus proclaimed, this is the new law. No. Jesus simply gave the two commandments from the old law that were the greatest. He said, these are the greatest ones. And that scribe actually agreed with Jesus. He said in verse 33, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And Jesus responded, you are not far from the kingdom of God. So Jesus was patting him on the back. You're right. These are greater than the burnt offerings. And Hebrews said that Jesus sacrificed for us his own blood. He, he made a sacrifice with his blood, not the blood of goats, not with the blood of uh, calves, but with his own blood. His blood, it brings eternal redemption. It's not circumstantial redemption like the animal blood, because animal blood and that, those sacrifices, that was a limited cleansing. But Hebrews said in chapter 9, verse 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God. This sacrifice, it is eternal. There is nothing limited about the sacrifice of Christ because he is the eternal God. So his sacrifice is eternal. 
But I want to go back to Jesus' remarks in Mark chapter 12, verse 34. You are not far from the kingdom of God. So let's dwell on that a little bit. If we were having a conversation with Jesus, then what would he be saying to us? Now, I don't want this to be a gut reaction that says yes or no. A gut reaction might go right to, well, you know what, I do have a lot of work to do. Or, well, I'm watching this sermon on YouTube, aren't I? You know, I'm sacrificing a little bit of my time. Yeah, sure, I'm good. No, toss this thought back and forth for a little bit. Would Jesus say to you, you have a long way to go? Or would he say, you know what, you're almost there. We got a little work to do together. Or would he say, you're doing good, keep it up? Remember, Hebrews said that the sacrifice of Christ's blood is eternal. And eternity, I don't know if you realize this or not, is a long time. So we should certainly ponder how far we are from the kingdom of God. But Jesus, he sacrificed himself so we don't have to go out and find our best lamb, find our best calf, and sacrifice that. He was the best. He was blemish-free. So we just need to remember those two commandments. So I ask you again, how far away are we? Do we love God with all of us? Do we love our brothers and sisters? First, what does it mean to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, souls, minds, and strength? Jesus went through one of the most painful, demeaning deaths imaginable. So what do we sacrifice for him? Do we sacrifice anything for him? Or is it all about ourselves? You know, we worship at our convenience. We serve him as far as we are comfortable going. We fit God in after we've done whatever we want to do first. I tell you what. Now, death on the cross was not convenient. It was not comfortable. And I can tell you this. Jesus' prayer in the garden before he was arrested, that tells me he really did not look forward to being there. He did not want to go on that thing. And secondly, what does it mean to love our neighbors as ourselves? Notice, Jesus did not say, love your family, love your friends, love your heroes, love those that you only agree with. No, he said, love your neighbor, which means love everybody. This means if you are a Republican, you need to love Biden, Harris, and Pelosi. Not agree with them. You don't have to agree with them, but you have to love them. You have to pray for them. You have to pray well for them. And if you're a Democrat, you need to love Trump, Pence, and McCarthy, who is the current minority speaker of the House. Once again, you don't have to agree with them, but you do have to love them. You do have to love and pray wellness over them. Loving your neighbor means praying for serial killers, praying for rapists, praying for racists. That they open their heart to God, that they change their ways, that they find peace and joy within themselves instead of the darkness that they are living in. You need to pray the love of God on them. Loving your neighbor means taking someone that did you ill and wishing them well. That sibling that hurts you. That schoolyard bully that you still actually think about every now and then and the mean things they said. That coworker that spread a rumor about you or your ex. It isn't easy. In fact, it's downright hard. But nothing about sacrifice is easy. Sacrifice is a challenge. If it wasn't a challenge, we wouldn't be sacrificing much now, would we? So what loving God and loving neighbor is not is loving your neighbor does not mean changing your morals to fully accept them. If their lifestyle is a sin, we can love them. We can disagree with them and have both at the same time. You can love and disagree at the same time. Loving God does not mean berating somebody over their lifestyle either. Once again, we can love and disagree at the same time. But berating, being ignorant, and things of that nature, that's not going to bring people into the kingdom. 
You cannot hate somebody into love. That's impossible. So loving someone does not mean accepting all of their ways. And disagreeing with them does not mean that you hate them. When did we lose sight of that fact? Did Jesus not die for our sins? And did he not ask us to pick up our crosses and follow him? 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 to 11. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. Jesus died for us out of love. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about that. He died for us because he loved us. God did not have to do that for us, but he did it because he loved us. And once again, if you read the prayer before Jesus' arrest, it's not like he was looking forward to it. It's not like he was going to Disney World and he was just pumped. No. No, he, he really didn't want to, but he did it because he loves us. He sacrificed for us. And for those who choose to follow him, who choose to follow the example he left us, Jesus instructed all of us in Mark chapter 8, verse 34. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Jesus expected us to make our own sacrifices, to deny ourselves to the very point that we might die for the very one who died for us. Jesus died with outstretched arms to greet his wayward creation. He died a painful and disgraced death so that we may live in peace and in grace. Are we willing to deny ourselves and sacrifice our comfort to sacrifice our pride or even sacrifice our very own lives for him? St. Augustine said, Thou payest debts, owing nothing. Remittest debts, losing nothing. That's from uh, Confessions. God paid our debts, even though he did not owe anything. That's what that means. But he forgave debts and lost nothing either. Because he gained us into his kingdom through that sacrifice. For all who have faith in him. We just need to confess to him. We just need to have faith in him and live out those two commandments. Are we willing to sacrifice for the same one who sacrificed for us? Remember, God loves you. I love you. Have a blessed day.